Hey, and welcome to the show today. You're listening to Sensensa.com, Feel Your Heart podcast. And we have another really great show for you today. This podcast is made by Sensensa.com, the leading relationship institute for relationship skills and courses based on science made practical. To get the one hour free webinar that will give you the key skills to get a safe, intimate and passionate relationship, just go to Sensensa.com and sign up. The link is in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and leave a review. It really helps me keep the positive energy going to make more podcasts. So I want to welcome Elizabeth on the show today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. No, my pleasure. And I'm actually really looking forward to this conversation. And I think later we'll be talking a bit more also about your training in the John Gottman method, which I know is something you use. But I think just to get an introduction to listeners out there, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing? Sure, yeah. So my name is Liz Earnshaw. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in the United States, and I work primarily in Philadelphia. So I'm licensed in Pennsylvania. I run a practice where we work with hundreds of couples and relationships um, a week, actually. So there's a lot of people in our practice that specialize in relationships. Um, The name of the practice is A Better Life Therapy. And I also do a lot of relationship training. So I teach classes on relationships. I do a lot of workshops on relationships because I'm just really passionate about helping people learn how they can utilize even the relationship they have with themselves to have better relationships with other people. Um, And, you know, I did a lot of training. I've I've done all of my training in relationships, actually. So went to school to be a marriage therapist. Um, I'm certified in the Gottman Method, as you mentioned. And so I'm just constantly in this stuff, like living and breathing it all the time. I'm also a mom and a wife. So stuff that I have to practice in real life too, not just talk about. <laughs> yeah, we all do. I guess there's no way around the one skill we all need in life, but but strangely don't learn as we grow up and go to school is how to relate mm-hmm. well to other people, right? Isn't that and I, interesting? It really is. Mm-hmm. And I always, again, I, I had a business before this that created social and emotional learning programs for children. And it was so surprising to realize how little focus that there actually is in school on these absolutely essential skills that really define very much our life and well-being. Um, So this is why I'm excited about talking to you about this today. And I can't remember who it was, but there was a relationship expert that had this fun saying. He said, one thing that's important to recognize about relationships is that we are all a pain in the ass. (laughs) <laughs> and 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 I think it's like Stan Tatkin says that a oh, lot. Oh yeah, that's that it. Might have been who that's that was. it. That's yeah. it. That's exactly him. And it made me laugh because there's something beautiful I in just it. accepting that too, and that it's about loving uh, partners, pain in the ass as well, and embracing that part too. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a bit about, you know, when you sit in your practice, what are some of the common issues that people or couples come in to to you to discuss with could you maybe go over some of those sure yeah so i would say that people come in with one of two things either they come in and they say something that is about having communication issues right they use this catch-all um phrase and say we have communication issues we just need to work on those and i'll talk about that in a second and then other people come in in crisis. So either they've had something really tragic and traumatic happen to them as a couple, somebody has died, somebody lost a job, um, somebody got very injured, someone's been diagnosed with cancer. And as a couple, they're trying to work on how to manage that stress together. And then people will also come in after some sort of betrayal. So an affair or learning that someone isn't really who they said that they were, um, that someone's been spending money that they didn't tell you they were spending. So usually people are either coming in because of this hugely stressful event or they're coming in and they don't really know how to describe what they're coming in for other than by saying communication issues. Um, And, you know, communication issues is usually a very basic way of saying, I don't know what we're in for, but I know we're not connected anymore. But there are so many things that are communication issues, right? So sometimes it is truly the way you communicate. Sometimes um, people come in because they just don't know how to express themselves. They don't know how 
to talk about their feelings. They don't know how to ask for what they need. And other times communication issues is kind of um, the way people say that they don't know how to actually come up with compromises, that they don't know how to agree with each other on things and that they're, they're stuck or they're gridlocked. Um, and then other times people use communication issues to say, we're not actually, um, we don't actually like each other anymore. <laughs> and so most of the time when I'm working with people, we have to uncover what it is that they're actually coming in for. Is it that they truly don't know how to communicate? Is it that they just aren't compatible anymore and this is the end of their relationship? Um, or is it that they are trying to figure out how to come up with decisions and solutions together um, and they, they need to practice doing that. They need to work on accepting each other's influence and um, being flexible with each other and all of that kind of stuff. So I would say overall, those are those are the top reasons that people come in. Thank you for giving that overview. And I guess also often the root of, of what we call communication issue has something to do with a lack of safety, right? I always say safety is kind of the foundation of, of uh, any relationship, I think, that flourishes. I always make this metaphor that it's like if we try to build a house on a big hill that's bound to have earthquake and mudslides and eventually will come crumbling down. So first we need to find a good solid foundation where we built that house, otherwise none of the tools will work, right? And I kind of feel that, Absolutely. that that's why when safety is broken and everything else seems to just go wrong. And even when you mentioned mm -hmm. expressing needs and boundaries, that kind of requires us to feel safe with our partner, right? Trust that they won't judge us, trust that they will actually respect our boundaries, etc. Um, so yeah, I, I just yeah. often found that underneath some of these, like you said, because it's so generic to hear, oh, we have communication issues, that often there's some kind of lack of somebody who's not feeling safe anymore. Absolutely. Um, or never felt safe. Mm. Um, based off of past relational histories that they're bringing into the relationship. Um, and I like that you brought up the fact that the tools won't work unless people feel safe. And I think a lot of the time when people say we have communication issues, they're hoping that there's going to be some simple tool that they can utilize in order to heal that communication issue. But like you mentioned, it's usually something much deeper, something much more emotionally based. Um, and it's usually about safety. And so a lot of people, I think, might feel frustrated sometimes in the beginning of the process when they're saying, please just tell us how to communicate. I want a five step process to do it. We'll go home and we'll do it and we'll be all better. And then I say, well, I think we need to explore a little bit. And I, I say exactly what you said, like, what is not feeling safe here? And sometimes that means exploring what has happened in this relationship. And sometimes it means exploring what is your enduring vulnerability that has entered into this relationship with you um, that makes you just generally not feel safe. I love that point, actually. And it's so important because I think we often forget that when we go into a relationship with somebody, we're also going into a relationship with all their history, right? And all the baggage and all their past relationship and partners that they still carry with them. And I think it's such an important point you bring up that sometimes it's also require individual therapy, I guess, for people to be able to establish that safety. If it comes from some core wounds that's not related to our current partner, that can keep bringing up these issues again and again and again, right? Absolutely. So sometimes it is really important that somebody is in their own individual therapy. One of the beautiful things about Gottman Method Therapy is that you spend a lot of time exploring and identifying your core wounds and talking about them. Um, and so that is an incredibly powerful experience because you're both exploring your own needs for healing, recognizing and building awareness around what's going on for you. And you're doing it in the presence of two safe people, right? The therapist and then also your partner. Um, and so exploring those core wounds, talking about how some of the things that your partner does triggers you into those core wounds um, is incredibly powerful work. And for the partner, it can help them to understand and put into perspective what's actually happening. Yeah, I think, uh, and I really love that point because I think, and I can't remember if it's Stan who said that as well, the idea about giving your partner a map 
of who you are, right? Because the more we have that map, the easier it is to navigate and and being able to understand each other's triggers because often I guess couples end up bickering and arguing in, in a logical debate when really they are actually having an emotional conversation because when one person is triggered, logic goes out the window and even our memory of yeah. events is not really that precise. So it's pointless at that point to have logical discussion and... Yeah. I guess if we know each other's triggers, then we're able to know, oh, my partner is now in a triggered state. So actually, I shouldn't try to speak logic with them. I need to help them try mm-hmm. and just regulate their nervous system. So what are maybe ways within the Gottman method that this could be explored, that people start exploring each other's triggers and past and, and become more aware of each other and build this map? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a couple of things that are preventative is building maps, right? So in the Gottman Method, we talk a lot about what is called a love map, which is essentially that you understand your partner's internal world. So you basically know what types of things upset them, what types of things make them feel good, what um, they are worried about in their lives in that moment, what makes them happy, who their friends are. So you have this internal understanding of them. And so to prevent... um, big crises in your relationship, you want to consistently be working on those love maps. You want to always be curious about your partner. You want to continually act as if there's somebody you need to get to know. And so that's often difficult in long-term relationships because we start to believe that we just know this person um, when we don't, when your partner will always be a mystery if you allow them to be a mystery, right? Because you have to choose to say, this person has information I don't know, and I'm going to seek it out instead of assume that I know them. So if you work on that, if you work on continually building love maps and getting to know your partner, it really does help during conflict moments because you see who this person is in all of their humanity. You recognize that you're not the only piece of it, right? You're able to see they are stressed out at work also. They are also triggered from the way their father used to treat them. They are also triggered because their previous partner cheated on them several times. So when you have love maps, you have a really beautiful foundation for having conflict with a person that you're going to be able to see for who they really are. Now, in the moment when the nervous system is dysregulated, in the Gottman method, we call that flooding. So when a person is physiologically flooded, their heart rate races. It goes above 100 beats per minute on average. That differs based off of, um, you know, whether you're a very active person or you're less active, but on average, over 100 beats per minute. If that happens, people physically cannot have, like you mentioned, a rational conversation. It's just not possible because their heart is racing, their muscles are tensing, their brain is flooding with stress hormones. And when those things happen, the only thing that they really have the capacity to do is to either shut down, leave, or rage. So fight, flight, flee, right? So those are the three things you're going to get. When you see a partner who is flooded, you might notice that they kind of cross their arms over their body, that they look glazed over as if they're not listening to you, that they are shaking their foot. Um, They might flutter their eyelashes very quickly. When your partner is doing these things, it is a physical signal that they actually can't be present with you in a conversation. And in those moments, the best thing that you can do if you're on the receiving end of that, is to choose to disengage, which is really, really, really hard. And I totally get pushback on that of, that's not fair. I want to talk about this. It's important. It's not fair that my partner can just, you know, get flooded and then we don't talk about it. But it takes at least 20 minutes for someone's body to go back to being in a physiological state where they can communicate again. So, If you have a partner who floods a lot, even planning ahead and saying, if I see these things come up, I'm just going to take a break. We'll come back to it in 30 minutes. Um, And during those 30 minutes, we'll both kind of take deep breaths, calm down. For the person flooding, if you recognize that's happening to you, if you recognize that you can't access your words, so that's a big sign. If you feel like you know that you have something to say, but those words 
can't leave your brain, go to your tongue and come out of your mouth, then you might be flooded if you notice your heart's racing, if you feel just completely shut down, like you can't even look that person in the eye. For you to recognize that and to try to use some soothing techniques can be really, really powerful. So breathing, squeezing your hands and letting them go. So tensing your muscles and then relaxing them. Um, and also letting your partner know, I love you, but I need a break. Um, and the reason I added the I love you part first is the more you can allow your partner to know that they are safe with you, that you're not abandoning them, the easier it is for them to let you go take a break. So those are some ways in the Gottman method that we work on dealing with that nervous system overload in the moment. Mm, I like that you brought up so many important points here. And I think one thing I just want to add too that I found so helpful, and especially this for myself too, is to add physical movement to regulate my nervous system. Um, because again, yeah. like you said, in the fight or flight, it's meant to either make us run away or fight off this threat, perceived threat, right? So I will put on music in my living room and have a dance or, or go for a run uh -huh. <laughs> or go out and hit my boxing bag. And again, that normally allows me to calm down enough that I can then use my breathing to then regulate the rest of the nervous system. While I found without the movement, even deep, you know, mindful breathing doesn't really do it for me. Um, so I guess, especially for people, if they start feeling a lot of anger, um, then it's a great way to start getting that physical movement and just, you know, use some of that adrenaline that, that is built up in the body. Um, and you mentioned one other thing I really liked, which was about the love map and about, the constant curiosity in your partner. And I think it's so important also because just by understanding how our mind works is that, you know, our mind is a story, storytelling organ that wants to create stories and meaning from everything, meaning that we here experience something from our partner, then if we don't have all the information, we will start filling out the gap with our own story, which is why we so often misinterpret it and misunderstand each other, right? Um, and therefore, yeah. having that yeah. curiosity, like you said, means that instead of filling in our own information and often making our own stories out of events, maybe if somebody is late and you suddenly say, oh, they don't care about me, they are, you know, I don't like them because they don't respect my time, that's again, that's my story. Um, and there instead the curiosity, like you say, I would try and ask and say, what happened? Why are you late? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And then I could actually get the information to fill out the gaps in my story that are true. Um, and that's why I really like that point you said, to keep being curious about your partner and also recognizing that our brain will make up our own stories. I think it's important to be aware of that, how often we actually do that in relationships, right? Yeah, we do it a lot. I always tell people curious, not furious. Yeah. <laughs> and it's an uh -huh. easy way for them to remember with that initial fury. If you can ask a question instead, sometimes you get information that you would have missed and it helps to diffuse it. Sometimes you ask the question and the person really was being a jerk and you might still be furious and that's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with anger, but a lot of the time in relationships, the initial reactivity to the other person and what they've done is a lot more to do with the story we're telling ourselves and the stories we've brought with us from the past than what's actually happening in the moment. And so asking a question can really ground you in the moment. Yeah, I like that. And also even our interpretation of those actions is based on our stories, right? So the fact that I interpret somebody being late as not caring is my story because it could very well be that it has nothing to do with them not caring. It's simply that they're not very good at time management. So again, this is where the curiosity is so good because again, it lessens the pain I feel when I realize they do care. They're just really bad at keeping time. Um so yeah, this curiosity I feel is so important. I want to jump on to another topic because one thing I feel is very often when people make bigger commitments to each other, whether it's marriage or move in together, then we often just have this presumption, you know, we're in love and it's all going to be fine. So people don't really sit down and actually discuss some of these things that could come up and become potential issues. What are maybe some discussions that you think people should have before they make you know big commitments like either moving in together or getting married or whatever it might be mm -hmm. yeah so I have very basic questions I think sometimes the premarital questions um, 
they they kind of miss the mark because they are about a lot of just opinions on things. You know, how many vacations do you want to take a year? How many, um, what size house do you want to live in? Like all of those types of things. Yes, they're nice to talk about, but they're really not going to teach you whether or not your partner can be your partner. So I suggest that you talk about things like, what do you think of when you think of marriage? You know, what... What do you expect? What does it mean to be a spouse? And what would it mean to be your spouse? So what are you hoping that you get from me? And when you're having this conversation, be as honest as you can in your answer too. Like don't censor your answer so that you seem like the ideal easygoing spouse. Really talk about what you're expecting. And if you're not sure what you expect, I suggest that you look back in your own family history and you go through the ways in which your parents managed their marriage. You might say, well, I hated my parents' marriage. It was terrible. I would never emulate it. However, you will be surprised to find that you often still end up expecting similar things. Um, and so really exploring what those marriage, what those commitment expectations are. The other thing that I encourage people to talk about is to talk about how they talk. How are we going to talk about things when we disagree? How do you want to agree together to bring up difficult topics? What happens if we cross the line? What happens if you really mess up or I really mess up? How are we going to handle that? And coming up with plans together about what you want that to look like in your relationship. Because you can talk about the what all you want, but there's always going to be a new what to talk about. You're going to, you know, you can talk about how many vacations you want to take and hopefully you're on the same page with that. But then 10 years in, you're going to be arguing about the way in which you put dishes away in the cabinets. And so instead of talking about those what's, you want to talk about the how. How are we going to manage our marriage? How are we going to manage disagreements? In our ideal world, what would we both like to take accountability for in the way that we're going to engage with each other? Those are the things that I think are really important to talk about. The third thing is recognizing that you're entering this relationship with contracts. They're unwritten, but You've presented a version of yourself and they've presented a version of themselves and you're contracting to commit based off of what you've seen. And so if anybody ever needs to change the contract, if you ever want to make a very different decision or live a very different life than what you have presented when you first committed, you have to be responsible for bringing that up. For instance, you go into the marriage with a good faith um, belief that you want to have children. Five years in, you decide you don't want to have children. You have to be able to have the courage to say, I'm changing our contract and I'm going to let you know that so that the other person can decide what they want to do with it. So yeah, talking about how you're going to talk, talking about your contracts, those are so incredibly important. I really like that. <laughs> and you know, the interesting thing when you talked about this, it reminded me of a book I read, which was about a Harvard study of 3,000 startups and why they failed because a startup to some extent is a bit like a marriage, you know, and often the co-founder just shake hand and say 50-50 and they hope that it all works out and in the majority yeah. of the time it doesn't. And what they found, the main reason they failed was not because of lack of money or lack of skills or that it wasn't the right idea or all these things that we normally talk about. The main reason they failed was because of issues in their interpersonal relationships with each other and the reason why was they haven't had these discussions you just mentioned right now so it's very interesting and his finding was that he recommended what you just said now that founder sit That's down so funny. <laughs> he basically said when you have disagreements about how to spend money how do you solve it you need to figure all this out before you go into a business partnership and it was pretty similar um to what you just described which makes sense because it's still a relationship and it's still bent on you know uh, based on interpersonal how we relate to each other and normally it's you know interpersonal relationships that break down that actually cause the destruction whether it's a marriage or a business so it's just very interesting Absolutely. to hear to hear the same yeah that's interesting <laughs> i love that i initially went to so my initial major was in organizational development so i work with businesses a lot on relational issues and i always say 
the same things that happen in marriages are what is happening in your business right now. <laughs> and you really need to look at it as a marriage and you need to have hard conversations the way you would in a marriage because the same exact interpersonal issues show up and um, the same skills that help intimate relationships often really help business partnerships. Yeah. That's uh, so true. And like I said, that's exactly the finding this this research study had. I think one thing I want to talk to you then about, because I like the idea of, you said, changing the contract um, and make your mm. partner aware if, if that's... Because you're right, we do commit to something that we've seen and, and not something radically different. So how... I guess often the challenge in many relationships is that people are not even fully aware of what their needs actually are because a lot of us have grown up and so used to suppressing a lot of our needs if we learned they weren't okay. Um, whether it's a need of, well, simply needing somebody else, whether it's a sexual need, whatever it might be, how are we able to mm -hmm. get in touch with those needs and also express them in a way that our partner can actually hear it. Because obviously if we just bombard our partner and suddenly say, oh, you never give me massages and I'm the one doing all that, they're unlikely to hear us. So what is a way first we can mm -hmm. get in touch with the needs and also how can we express it in a way they can actually hear and maybe be able to give them to us? Mm -hmm. I love that question. Many of us grow up believing that self-betrayal is kind of the only way to create relationships, which essentially means putting your needs to the side, pretending like they don't exist, sucking it up. So I would say a lot of us do not know how to re truly recognize our needs. And then even when we do, we really struggle to bring it up in a way that the other person can hear us and in a way that helps them to be successful with us. So The first thing that I usually suggest to people is kind of counter to figuring out what you need. Think about all the things that you don't like and make a list of those things. People can do that very, very quickly because we know how to recognize, I don't like it that my partner comes home late. I don't like it that they don't text me on time. I don't like it that they massage me in this way, right? So we recognize the things we don't like. So if you can sit down and list those and then give yourself a little bit of a brain exercise, which is to push yourself into talking about it in terms of what we call positive needs. So when we say what we don't want, that's a negative need because we're talking in the negative. When we say what we do want, that's a positive need. So you have to sharpen that skill. You have to sharpen your ability to say, well, if I don't want them to be home late, what is it that I actually do want? I want them to be home on time. And why? I want them to be home on time because I need routine. Routine is really, really important to me. And I like to know when I can expect that they're home. Um, I don't want the dishes to be in the sink anymore. <laughs> Why don't I want that? Well, I really like a clean house. Why? I really like a clean house because it makes me feel calm and at peace and organized and I can rest in my home then. So I really, what I need is I need calm and I need peace and I need organization. So if you do this little exercise, you can actually work with yourself to find out what you want right? And then ask yourself why, and then that often uncovers what the need is. Then you're able to express that need to other people in those terms. And what we know about people is that they do much better when you tell them what you do want than when you tell them what you don't want. So if I say to my husband, I don't like that you come home late every night. I don't want you to do that anymore. My husband is likely to get defensive right? Or maybe he says, okay, babe, I'll try not to do it. But he doesn't really know like what I need underneath all of that. But if I say to him, when you get home late, it makes me feel really distracted from my routine. And I really need to know what I can kind of expect from day to day. Can we talk about how we can set some sort of routine up. Well, now my husband knows exactly what I want and he's not going to accidentally try to meet my need in his own way. He's going to recognize that we need to talk about routine and that's a need that becomes a little bit more clear. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think again that this, and you brought this up as well, instead of trying to blame which or attack our partner, which will just trigger again their adrenaline response so they can't really hear us anyway. Um, then there's, I think, something wonderful about also 
trying to tap into the empathy with like you said that the why why is it i need that is because i need peace and and order to feel calm in my own home and i think actually it was a good lesson that i think i i learned when i um started just for as a hobby to study about filmmaking and storytelling how by creating empathy by telling the why behind the character it's actually possible to feel sympathy and empathy even for somebody doing bad things in a movie and the interesting thing is mm-hmm. that when we can explain our why that we need something and we can be in touch and express that then that will trigger empathy in the other rather than their stress response right because when we understand Absolutely. people's story then they they can feel for us um And yeah, it's just a lesson I got from that. And I think it fits so well with the psychology of being able to say, you know, I need you to be on time because, you know, having that certainty makes me feel safe and it makes me feel stressed and unsafe if I never know when you're going to arrive. Then that is much easier to feel empathy for than when I say, why are you late again? It's so annoying. I can never trust when you're late, right? Exactly. And when we criticize in that way, it elicits defensiveness most of the time. Even in the least defensive partner, someone's going to feel the need to defend themselves, right? Because they don't want to be categorized in that way. It doesn't leave them a lot of room. Again, I like to use the word successful. It doesn't leave them room to be successful for you because you've already told them that they fail, that they fail in a big way. They're always late. They're always inconsiderate. So How could they ever win? And when people don't feel like they can win, they're less likely to work with you. Yeah, that's uh, I like that point. So again, it's about trying to help our partner succeed at what we actually would like, you know, whatever need it is. We want them to feel that they can succeed. Otherwise, you're right. Why yeah. would they even bother trying? And and I guess we have uh, it's a good. What is a good old saying that goes? Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Um, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I wanted to ask you as well about the what was it the big bang I think was it that you mentioned what that means mm. that expression if you can maybe talk a bit about that as well Yeah so I call certain moments in a relationship the big bang as a playoff of you know a lead towards extinction <laughs> um so there are these moments in relationships that can really harm a relationship just in one fell swoop. So um, for instance, saying something that the person never forgets, right? You have a mostly healthy relationship and then your partner says something that is so piercing that you're not able to ever forget it. And because of that, it changes how you engage with them. It changes how you feel about them. It builds resentment over time. And often it can lead to the end of a relationship. Other things that are big bangs are obviously affairs. Um, So like the moment you find out about the affair, the relationship will never be the same again. Um, when When people have children, a lot of couples will have that moment. So it's this moment where your partner doesn't come through with you and come through for you in the way you had expected that they would during a very upsetting or stressful moment. And it completely changes the way that you see them. And unless a couple is very intentional about how they repair that and how they respond to that, it leads to a cycle of resentment and punishment that can ultimately end the relationship over time. And it might not happen right away, um, but you, you will know that you've had one of those moments if it's been like five years and when you're in a fight, you're still cycling back to that one thing that happened you know I'm mad at you right now for the dishes but I'm also going to bring up the fact that you didn't show up to my mother's funeral so there's these moments that they just fog the rest of the relationship couples can get through them but they have to be incredibly intentional about the security that they create the repair process that they enter into together Yeah, I'm so happy you mentioned that. Actually, I wrote an article a while about this, uh, where I think instead of the Big Bang, I really like your expression. I just called it key moments. But you're right. It's oh, these, I like that too. It, it's just <laughs> these places where I think where we have a where our attachment is really hurt and the safety is really damaged, and our trust that the other person will be there for us, right? And and I can even see in my ex marriage where that happened. Um, where she yeah. mentioned she didn't feel doing pregnancy that I was fully there for her and and that became this overall wound that then colored the lack of trust 
And again, back then, I didn't have the, I guess, self-awareness and skill set that I would have now to have that understanding and to sit down and try and start repairing that. And I think afterwards, luckily, I have. And I've been through that repair process a few times where, you know, it's very much, at least I can tell for me, and you can obviously just add or change if you think there's other ways of doing it. But for me, it's about first the hurt partner being able to express the impact and had on them and the partner who caused the hurt they then acknowledge that and state clearly that they understand that. And then the next step is that they take responsibility. And that could be, yeah, I can really understand. They don't have to agree. There's a big difference. We don't have to agree to acknowledge what we've done was harmful for somebody else, right? We just have to see the impact that it had. And I can really see that my action hurt you and caused you a lot of pain and made you not trust me. And I think for me, the last piece is then acknowledging or stating what will be done different to change that behavior in the future so they don't get hurt in the same way again. And I've run through this process a few times where it seemed to work very, very well. I don't know if you have anything you think that should be added to that process or done differently. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly it. It's so important in, in the initial stages that the person that created some of the harm is able to hear that harm without... Um, justifying, explaining themselves, and by really showing a lot of empathy. Like you said, showing an understanding of why this happened and what they need to do differently um, and what they're going to do differently to prevent it from happening again. Um, The only thing I would add is that for the person that was harmed, something that's really, really key is being able to get clear with yourself in this moment about what you need Mm. because many times people do not know what they need in order to feel safe with the other person again and so nothing feels like it sticks right and then you kind of get caught in the cycle of feeling angry feeling let down Um, but as soon as you can get clear and say to your partner this is what I need to see in order to feel safe again. This is what I need to hear. This is what, once, once these things happen, I believe that I'm going to be able to start moving forward in our relationship. And so that person needs to be clear on that. Otherwise, what tends to happen is the goalposts will continue to move. So the partner will do what they think is helpful to begin the healing process. And then the other person will say, nope, I'm still really angry and now I need you to do X, Y, and Z. And if that process continually happens over the long term, then both people become really frustrated and they really lose the energy to continue to repair the relationship. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And again, I guess it's the same that sometimes happen around uh, the idea of, of love languages where one partner keep giving and giving and giving and they don't understand it doesn't have an impact because maybe they are they are giving their own love language and not the one their partner understands and yeah and I guess get in touch with yeah yeah absolutely and again the more you know each other's love maps we can cycle back around to that the more you're going to recognize what the other person needs instead of just trying to guess what they need and then falling short, which is incredibly frustrating to be in that position. Yeah, Th- thank you for, I think these are so important points. I wondered, because I also know that you trained obviously in the Gottman method, which is very mm-hmm. recognized. And I know they're put in a lot of research for decades in, in understanding these relationship tools. Would you be able to share some of of your favorite tools with us and maybe give some examples of how people could implement some of these tools. Absolutely. One of my favorite tools is recognizing what John Gottman calls the four horsemen. Have you heard of the four horsemen before? Yeah, I did. Yeah. 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 So the four horsemen are essentially four communication habits that over his decades of research he's found can lead to divorce at a pretty significant rate if they're not changed. And those four habits are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. So if you can recognize those four things in your relationship and begin to shift them, you can really change the trajectory of your relationship. Of course, it takes both people to do that. 
So instead of criticizing, being able to use what we talked about earlier, which is expressing your needs. So not saying um, you're always late, I hate it, but I really need for you to be home on time because it's very helpful to me so that I feel safe. Instead of defensiveness, which is I'm not always late, you're the one that just gets home too early. It's being able to say, you're right, I could see how having a different schedule every day would feel kind of dysregulating. So being able to take responsibility for your part and also being able to validate the other person. The third thing is stonewalling. Stonewalling happens when we're flooded and we shut down, which means we become a stonewall. We talked about this a little bit earlier. The way you can shift out of that is for the person experiencing the flooding to say, I love you, but I need to take a break and to use breathing, to use their energy, to distract with something unrelated, to bring their heart rate back down and to release their muscle tension. And for the partner who is on the other end of the flooding to allow that person to take a break. Don't follow them around the house. Don't say that you know you wanna talk right before bed if they're saying they need to go to sleep. Allow them to reduce their heart rate. And then the final is contempt. So contempt is the worst one of all four because it is criticism supercharged and it actually verges on being kind of abusive. When we show contempt, we are belittling the other person. We are saying, I'm above you. So not only are we saying you're always late and I don't like that, we might say something like, your mother would be ashamed if she knew she raised a man that gets home so late and doesn't care about his family. So that's contempt. And you can imagine what my face probably looked like when I said it. Yeah. When we have contempt, our noses scrunch up as if we are disgusted. It's the only unilateral facial expression, which means only one side of our face goes upwards. So we kind of smirk at the person. Um, and our body posture is a posture of I'm better than you. When contempt happens, it's incredibly dangerous to the health of the relationship. It sig signals that there's a complete lack of respect. And to change contempt, the person who shows contempt needs to figure out, am I showing contempt because this is how I learned to express frustration growing up? Or am I showing contempt because there's some unresolved hurt and pain in this relationship, which has led me to disrespect my partner so deeply? And instead of being abusive towards my partner, am I able to own that and express what's actually happening for me? So when you learn those four things, and it, it takes a little bit of work, but when you learn to recognize them and then shift into the opposite behavior, communication can really improve in your relationship. So that's one of my favorite um, little Gottman tidbits and obviously probably the most popular. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And also, I think Gottman also talked a bit about, I think he calls it gentle startups. Is that right? Would you be able maybe to mention gentle a bit startup. about Gentle startup. Yes. So gentle startup is what's called the antidote to contempt or criticism. Contempt too. Um, and the way that gentle startup works is that you bring up your issue gently. And that within the first three minutes of a conversation, we can essentially guess where the conversation's going to go. So if you bring something up abrasively, the conversation will probably be pretty abrasive. If you bring it up gently, there's a higher likelihood that the conversation will be gentle and that it will end in a way that feels satisfying to both people. The template for gentle startup is by starting um, by expressing what you notice. So. You know, I noticed that we've been picking on each other all week. I noticed that we've been kind of distant this week. I've noticed that recently I haven't spent as much time with you as I used to. And then saying what your feeling is. That makes me feel sad. I feel frustrated. I feel angry. I feel disappointed. And then following up by what you need. I really need us to find some more time to spend together. I need to feel safe in this relationship. I need to feel at peace. All of those things we talked about earlier. So essentially, gentle startup means starting the conversation by saying, I've noticed X, it makes me feel Y, and what I need is Z. 
Mm, perfect. Thank you. There are definitely some really good tips for the listeners. Lots of, of free good tips to use. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. What I wanted to ask you as well is where can people find you if they want to, you know, contact you and work with you or want to know more? Could you just maybe let people know that? Absolutely. So you can find my therapy practice at www.abetterlifetherapy.com. You can also find me on Instagram at Liz Listens. And I also have a program called Love Lessons, which teaches a new course on love every single month. Um, and you can find that if you find me at Liz Listens. It's just a link in the bio. It's super easy to find. Perfect. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing your knowledge. It's been really, really valuable. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so nice to talk. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and come back for our new weekly podcast. Also, leave a review to keep the positive energy going. That really keeps me motivated to make more of these podcasts. If you want to learn the key skills to a safe, intimate, and passionate relationship, then head over to sensensor.com and join the free one-hour webinar. The link is in the description. You'll learn the four reasons that relationships break down, the how your attachment style may fuel conflict with your partner and how to break that cycle, why people cheat and the one tip that can prevent it, the simple three-step formula to lasting love. So thank you for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you next week for another podcast. <music>